The next session is on e-government implementation strategies. I'll introduce the chair of this, of this panel, Mr. Robert N. Ford, the second vice president of the ICT Chamber Private Sector Federation of Rwanda. Robert is CEO of Filmax Web Technologies that specializes in eGov solutions. He is formerly past president of RUSA and ex core member committee for Remit alumni. Maybe at one point he'll tell us what Remit is. For now, <laughs> I'd like to invite him so that he can introduce his panelists. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, uh, for that uh, short introduction. Uh, RIMIT is Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, uh, where I acquired my uh, computer science degree. Um, but uh, I not take a lot of time. Uh, it's very difficult to become chair after the, the Secretary General of CTO has just uh, taken that position because he made uh, the past uh, presentation very lively, uh, interactive, and we all enjoyed it. And I'll do the best I can to make sure that um, I bring in the energy that uh, you all deserve to be able to uh, follow up on discussions. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a panel of uh, presenters who are going to take us through our main discussion today, which is going to be implementation of uh, eGov um, in our respective countries. Uh, to begin with, uh, I wish to present um, Jean-Jacques uh, Massima Lanji. Uh, and as soon as I, as I call upon you, please take your chair at the front. Uh, Jean-Jacques is a representative for Central Africa and Madagascar, uh, the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, he has uh, managed the he is a very uh, experienced uh, e-government uh, official. He has managed the Iraq project at the ITU. Uh, so, he has been at the center of uh, our policy implementation uh, for, for Iraq, uh, for Gabon, uh, and for many other countries uh, in Africa. Uh, he is going to, one of our other panelists that is going to be with us, who has just been on the panel here, is um, uh, Catherine Kitao. She is going to help us in the previous discussion she talked about um, she talked about the, the disparity that there is between generations on adoption of, uh, of uh, services, government services through electronic governance. And now she is going to help us understand how can this be implemented? How can we get the technology to different people? And her bio had just had been presented by, uh, by the other chair who was here. Uh, we also be having uh, another person on the panel uh, Mr. Uh, Elman Tigele Chanakir. Uh, and I will need uh, us to, I need all of you to help me welcome this man because he is one of our gold sponsors. He's the group chief executive for 23rd Century Systems. Uh, we are so honored to have him. Um, he holds a master's degree uh, in business administration specializing in business informatics from the University of Frankfurt in Germany. Uh, he, started his, he started his career in Germany after leaving university as a systems analyst, programmer for a subsidiary of International Degusa uh, AG before returning to Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, Erman worked for the Agricultural and Rural Development Authority. Uh, uh, he is also um, he is also, uh, the, uh, oh, okay, in Zimbabwe, uh, 
He worked for the Authority Forestry Commission and Cotton Company of Zimbabwe as head of ICT before founding uh, 23rd Century Systems. Uh, the company has grown from a single employee company in 1996 to a company employing over 300 people as of today with presence in seven countries in Africa, namely Kenya, Malawi, Rwanda, Uganda, Zambia, South Africa, Nigeria, and also in the Middle East. So we are so honored to have him in our midst. Uh, we'll also be uh, having um, Paula Ingabire, who is the head of ICT department at Rwanda Development Board. Paula, thank you for joining us on the panel. Uh, we have, uh, last but not least, um, Clement Wageneza. Uh, he's, he's the chief executive officer for Rwanda Online, who is also one of our sponsors. Uh, Clement uh, Wageneza, uh, who is the CEO of Rwanda Online, uh, the company is called Rwanda Online Platform Limited. It's a company providing platform that enables online and automated provision of government to citizen and government to business services. Prior to joining Rwanda Online, he was the managing director at Axis, a software company he founded in 2006. Clement has built an excellent experience in software projects management and innovation management. He has co-founded prominent ICT industry institutions, including the Rwanda ICT Chamber, the Rwanda Software Association, and K-Lab Innovation Space. In 2014, Clement was awarded the Outstanding Young Rwandan Entrepreneur Prize at the ALN Africa Awards for Entrepreneurship. Uh, I am so happy to have uh, this very exciting and very rich, uh, academically rich, uh, 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 intelligent people who are here to share with us their different uh, exposés on electronic governance. Uh, to begin with, we'll be having uh, the ITU Government Implementation Toolkit, which is going to be presented by Jean-Jacques Massimalangi. Jean-Jacques, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. So, uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Is it loading? Yeah, what you have to do is press this one. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. With this ICT, you need to open your computers and uh, take care of. Uh, um. okay. okay, so thank you uh, very much. Uh, I'm very happy to to try to present to you what uh, ITU is doing in terms of e-government, and particularly the implementation toolkits available uh, regarding e-government and e-health. Uh, so uh, I must. Uh, confess that uh, I am uh, the representative for Central Africa, but I am not the one in charge uh, specialized on e-government. We have some colleagues in Geneva and another colleague in, in Dakar who is in charge of the implementation of all these programs uh, among the, the region. Uh, but I will do my best uh, to present to you uh, what is available. So you will see uh, in each slide that okay, all these presentations are available uh, and his project program publication are available in the ITU website. And uh, mainly, you have some uh, latest publication on e-government uh, and uh, uh, e-health, uh, jointly with WHO and so on, are, are all available. You just need to have uh, what we call the ties, ties password, in order for you to download freely all the content uh, of these websites. So what is uh, this toolkit about? Well, this toolkit uh, will answer to the first 
the question we see in the last panel uh, on, on about the readiness. Uh, it's a readiness assessment framework, and uh, this toolkit examines the dimension of the e-government uh, environment and uh, is intended to help decision makers uh, in order to, to, to try to build their strategies and, of course, to try to implement them, because uh, the problem is not to build strategies on the papers, but to implement effectively uh, uh, the solutions uh, gathered uh, with the best practices uh, along the world. Uh, now, oh, this toolkit, uh, next slide please, this toolkit is divided in uh, three main, four main parts. Uh, of course, you go from bottom to up, you have the first the infrastructure, which is uh, always critical. Most of the African countries uh, have not uh, achieved their broadband uh, infrastructure programs. After you have a policy, you have to renew all the time the laws and try to update uh, the, the content of these laws with the technologies. Uh, you have, of course, uh, the governance issues, uh, which the, the, the aim of this, uh, the, this, uh, this forum, and the outreach. Uh, and all of these modules are developed, uh, and, and you will find in uh, all the details process uh, any information you, you may need, you may wish. And to consult uh, in order to build your, your own strategy and uh, to tailor your, your own suit regarding uh, the economical uh, context of your country. The government uh, readiness uh, quick check tool is there. It, it, it addresses mainly uh, the ICT skills, uh, the access, and uh, some indicators, as told by some colleagues. Indicators are published by our ICT Indicators Division in Geneva. Uh, and uh, also, uh, you have uh, the web-based public services uh, whose indicators are, uh, are made uh, to try to, to, to publish uh, a kind of ranking. I, I must confirm that uh, okay, this ranking is not to make a competition among countries. Uh, this ranking is just in order to see what's the way uh, we need to, to, uh, to make it together in order to, 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 to find a, a critical uh, solution uh, to address these e government issues. Uh, so the tool uh, assists uh, also the identification of uh, the, the actions and uh, to build so to define some priorities uh, in order for you uh, to try to see at different income level uh, of your economies, what you can access. So it goes, the color here, you will see the priority, and it goes from the green to the red, and uh, you will see the different level of priorities depending of the level of the economies. So it's there, you, are, you, you all have a presentation, which have been distributed among all the participants and registered participants. I will not go into the details, but you can check uh, that there is a main difference between the high level income countries and the LDCs, of course, it uh, remains on the infrastructure. The basic infrastructure should be there uh, with the basic civil security tools, with the basic KPI infrastructure uh, in order to try to enhance and to build uh, these uh, e-government solutions. Uh, in some uh, other uh, plan, we are working uh, jointly with uh, uh, WHO uh, on EF program, which is a big part of the e-government uh, uh, program in ITU, uh, because we have developed uh, some, some, some strategy toolkit for that. And as you know, we launched uh, already uh, in the e-health program uh, some uh, consultation uh, uh, with academia, uh, uh, research centers, and so on. But mainly, this initiative is very good because uh, you will see that there is concrete examples of uh, e-health applications uh, which, which are trying to, to facilitate the life of people, uh, mainly in Africa and in rural areas. Uh, in those, for example, after this publication, yes, leave the publication, go to the next slide. I will give some example uh, directly after this. Where, yes, you, you have mainly uh, uh, e-mobile, uh, uh, mobile health application, which is a very, very good example. Uh, with, with joint, uh, yes, be healthy, be mobile. Okay, uh, this application was developed uh, and uh, in uh, some countries, yes, uh, during the Ramadan in Senegal, for example. We developed tools uh, to check uh, uh, the tense of the people and so on, and uh, to have a very quick uh, reactive so, uh, approach within the, the doctors and so on, which is a, a success. In uh, some other countries also, uh, we developed uh, it in, uh, in Zambia for cervical 
cancer screening uh, uh, in Costa Rica for uh, smoking cessation. All these programs were developed in collaboration with WHO, uh, taking uh, all these mechanisms uh, and uh, readiness process and so on as developed by this, uh, this toolkit. Uh, we have also uh, in uh, M government report, mobile technology for responsible governments and uh, connected societies, these M applications uh, globally are very, very uh, uh, looked at in our IT, ITU study groups, ITUD. You have a link here to go in the IT, ITUD study groups and cyber applications and uh, to see what is available in terms of M government, mobile government and mobile technologies. Uh, we are not only speaking of M payment, M PESA and the others, but we have, we have other mobile uh, applications who are now available uh, and uh, who are uh, developed uh, through these toolkits and uh, accessible to everyone who want to implement them. Uh, next kit, a new, a new study education has been uh, approved by the last uh, uh, World Development and Communication Conference on smart societies. This is also a new concept, a new initiative from DDT. And I know in the table I saw you have also, we are speaking of smart farmers here in Rwanda and so on. This is in the same line. Uh, you are speaking of smart farmers and all this, it's building smart societies with this, uh, this smart initiative launched by uh, ITU BDT. Uh, so this is also a, a concrete example of what we can do, develop and implement in terms of uh, e-governance. Uh, training modules on smart cities are available. These modules uh, are there, uh, available online. You can train, you can uh, uh, try to enhance your uh, capacity building of your team uh, and, and uh, even be proactive with uh, the developer who are based in Geneva to try to help you. Uh, now, uh, as usual, uh, the, the assistance made to countries is always made upon request of countries. Uh, you, you have to go from yourselves and have to make an official request to ITU if you need uh, some assistance on, on these points. Next, please. So, okay, I promise to be very short uh, because uh, I think it's an interactive panel and discussions. Uh, I have these uh, uh, ten, 10 slides uh, just to, to say that uh, ITU has developed a lot of tools. These tools are free, available uh, for everyone, uh, and uh, feel free to contact us if you need some guidance, some assistance, or even to have some data, some information uh, gathered with best practices uh, on this subject. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was a very nice uh, expose uh, on... Um, on the toolkit, on the ITU tool toolkit. And uh, to briefly summarize about what you talked about, you talked about the toolkit being available online, so you can always access it. Uh, the toolkit emphasizes on not just laying the strategies, but also looking at the implementation. It provides what the platforms that you need, it provides you the, the facilities that you require to make informed choices about implementation of electronic governance. He talked about the four major uh, issues affecting implementation, which is infrastructure, which had been spoken about earlier, uh, policy uh, and policies which are always changing to be able to match the ever-changing technologies that we have. Uh, then government uh, and outreach. Once you have government, you have policies and you have the technology, how do you get this to uh, the population that deserve it to be able to uh, begin accessing uh, citizen services. Uh, he talked about issues related to ICT skills. Uh, he talked about access to the indicators, which are already in the toolkit. And he specifically uh, mentioned that the indicators are not supposed to uh, compare countries and compare progress between regions, but they are supposed to be there to help you understand uh, your, your goalposts, uh, your milestones, your roadmap in implementation. Uh, he also talked about, uh, uh, when we talk about electronic governance, what are we specifically focusing on at the government level? And he talked about e-health, e-education, mobile, and, uh, and a, a, a series of other things like uh, uh, M-government and mobile technologies. Thank you very much again. Um, in the interest of our presenters being able to follow the presentations which are going to be given, may I request uh, you now to, to sit in the, in the, to come down. Then we will be uh, bringing you back on the platform uh, during the, the, the question session. Thank you.
Uh, and we, we should now be preparing for um, our next presentation, which is going to be given to us by Catherine uh, from the Ministry of... Yes. I don't have a presentation, but I can just talk. You can, can, you can come and just talk. Thank you very much. I interrupted her on her way to sit. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry you have to listen to me again. Uh, I remember once taking a plane in a developed country and uh, w uh, there's a, a very nice lady ushered us on. I think she was a stewardess. Then she made the announcements. Then she served us with food. And at some point I suspected she was also flying the plane because she disappeared for some time. So uh, I think I'm playing that role today. Um, so uh, I think this session was about infrastructure, but I'll try to make it more broad because I think I had already reported on uh, some of the things that Kenya is doing in uh, the area of infrastructure. Um, and first of all, I'll say that uh, in Kenya, the right to quality public services is enshrined in our constitution. Um, for those of us, uh, those of you who wish to download uh, the Constitution of Kenya 2010, which you can, um, Article 6, Article 21, Article 232. Um, now, if we now bring e-government into the picture, then I think it implies a certain right to broadband connectivity because this is the way in which uh, e-government is going to deliver these services and therefore um, we cannot talk about an equi equitable right to quality public services without also grappling with the issue of how does everybody get a chance to access an e-service. Now, now, I'll just throw in another idea, which is that we, for a long time, maybe uh, for the last uh, 20, 30 years, have also been talking about the potential of this technology to create employment and to solve some of our major social problems uh, of wealth creation and sustainable livelihoods. And again, we have to think, what kind of infrastructure do we have to put in place in order to ensure that this, this technology meets its potential. And perhaps another question which it, uh, is implied there is what should government be doing? Because we know that the private sector has come in very aggressively, and not just in Africa, but across the world, to provide infrastructure. Now in Kenya, what are we doing? as government. One, we are actually grappling with this issue of where is our space because we know that the private sector moves a lot more quickly uh, than governments. So uh, for example, we started our first mile uh, projects uh, in about 2009 and uh, five years uh, down the line um, we had been able to deliver first mile co uh, limited uh, WiMAX first mile connectivity to about 28 out of our 30, uh, 47 counties. And uh, of course, this was too slow. So in the meantime, the private sector came in very aggressively. And uh, right now, um, they're in all counties and uh, providing uh, fiber and other uh, types of technology offerings. And we needed to do some soul searching and say, are we irrelevant? Um, or should we fight uh, the public sector and demand that uh, public institutions use government infrastructure? Or do we need to exploit um, that which is being provided and which is good, um, but in the right way? So some of the things that are happening now are, uh, there's a critical infrastructure bill which is uh, in, in draft stage in Kenya. And what does this say? We are recognizing ICT infrastructure as critical infrastructure, just like roads, energy, uh, oil pipelines. Yeah. And this, uh, first of all, integrates, which is, I think, is uh, believe something which is happening across East Africa is to integrate it into planning. 
So for example, as you know, whenever you are building a road, uh, there's a certain amount of access which is left for certain services to be delivered alongside the, the road, like power lines. Now as ICT is, becomes critical infrastructure by law, then there will be provision made for every bit of infrastructure that is built, whether it's a building, whether it's a road, there will be provision made for the ICT component. And I think this will go a long way in making sure that infrastructure, I mean, ICT infrastructure follows development. Now, we also have uh, emerging plans and strategies some of them that are coming from our third sector, that is uh, higher education and universities, they recently uh, drafted a cloud strategy, which they presented to the government for adoption. What were they saying? They were saying that uh, in Africa, it may take us a long time to develop all the very uh, expensive uh, te uh, technology such as data centers. But here is an opportunity to leapfrog by using technology such as the cloud to quickly uh, gain access to uh, the right amount of infrastructure uh, for our data storage, to quickly gain access to platforms and applications that can help us to quickly start implementing ICT in areas where it would have taken years or decades to develop our own uh, technology. But of course, this required careful thought because it may also require a transfer of finances because cloud services have to be paid for. Um, but those are things where, which we are grappling with as a government and trying to see with the help of our higher education sector, our research sectors, to see how can we use this technology that's on offer in the best possible way for our circumstances. Now, somebody talked about institutions. Yes, ICT needs institutions that are capable of implementing, but perhaps even more so, managing and maintaining infrastructure. And this is an area that we're still grappling with. We have formed an ICT authority um, that is beginning to bring together the capacity, uh, but also the instruments, such as what we call the government enterprise architecture, which is uh, a document which is going to regulate uh, the development of technology within the public sector. And uh, those institutions are what is going to make our ICT sustainable. Have we chosen the right institutions? We believe we have, but it's a continual learning process. And I think the more developed countries that have shared with us have told us that over time this also evolves, the kind of institutions that you need to implement and manage and maintain your ICT evolves as the country reaches different stages of ICT development. Now finally, I'll talk about capacity and inclusiveness. Um, in our countries, and this is what I was trying to say, I was not trying to say that there are some people who are left behind. I'm trying to say that there are people leading nomadic lifestyles. Uh, there are people who live in very difficult terrains, and at the same time, we have people who live in very urbanized environments which look almost like first world uh, environments. All of these people are our people and we need to deliver to them the most appropriate technologies that will meet their needs across the board. And uh, just like my, our colleagues in Rwanda, we're looking at uh, cutting edge wireless technologies, we're looking at LTE, uh, we're looking at satellite, and all other technologies that can deliver uh, uh, broad, uh, broadband levels of connectivity to even the remotest areas that can continue to deliver uh, broadband to people who are on the move and who do not settle in one place for long periods of time. And uh, since many of uh, my colleagues who are introduced are in the area of software, I think we ne really need to think about what kind of technology is appropriate for us, linguistically, culturally, um, in terms of the applications that are most important to the lifestyles and livelihoods of all our people, whatever kind of a lifestyle they may be needing. I said last, but last, but last. Um, what about the costing? 
Yeah, can people afford this technology? That is another big issue for sustainability. And we need to think what kind of technology needs to be free? What kind of technology can we subsidize to bring it down to the right uh, cost for those who need it to continue their lives? And what kind of technology can continue to help our countries thrive and grow and become wealthier by being fully commercialized? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine Gitao, for uh, that very nice uh, expose that you just given us. It was very enriching. I managed to capture a few things, uh, which are also going with a few questions and reflections on what you just said. It is very true that to be able to create equitable uh, infrastructure that is going to help our citizens, we have to focus and orient ourselves towards what is it that our people need, what is it that our people want. And Catherine has uh, helped us understand that equitable to quality public service has got to have the kind of infrastructure like broadband, where you are very sure that you sustain the speed and accessibility is going to be easy. He, she talked about technology being an engine to creating employment. That this technology should not just be about providing ego services, but should also be about who uses this and what kind of um, benefit do they get out of it. So what should government be doing as private sector moved, uh, she talked about how government tried to set up the infrastructure. She talked about the involvement of the private sector in moving faster to lay out what we need. She gave us an experience for Kenya, which was very good. And I think a question comes through after such a presentation. You say, how does government tap on private sector infrastructure that has been laid to be able to deliver uh, equitable electronic governance services or to be able to efficiently deliver services to citizens. And I think we have experiences in Rwanda, in other countries in the region, where a certain level of cohesion has to be created between the, the private sector and the government to work together as a team because the common goal is going to be uh, the citizens. They need to have uh, those services delivered to them. Uh, she talked about cloud strategy, which should be aimed at cutting the cost of investment in data centers and other infrastructure. But then also that imposes a question of fees. Is it if you go cloud, you have to make sure that the fees to access data through cloud is much cheaper than making investments in physical hardware. So. Uh, thank you very much for that expose. We should be coming back with questions. Some of these are challenging questions which I'm throwing to the audience so that you can be best prepared when the question session comes. Uh, help me to welcome um, our other presenter, uh, Mr. Elman Tigele Ch Ch Chanakira, Group Chief Executive Officer, uh, 23rd Century Systems. Thank you. A very good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen. This morning I'm just going to discuss with you briefly on Is there a hold on the Oh it's moving for now, okay. There's something wrong with this clicker, I think the battery might be going. Um okay. Uh can move it on for you, just give, just give us the nod. I'll, I'll okay. you back. So, yeah, I'm just going to cut briefly with you this morning on 
delivering public value through co-creation. I think really it's important that it's very critical that governments engage citizens in terms of delivering services. That citizens they become part and parcel of the whole infrastructure to deliver government services. To deliver government services. And then they are part of the system and will co-create with the government in terms of delivering services. But it's important also that the government provides an enabling environment which allows the citizens to be able to be part of that ecosystem that delivers services to the citizens. And this can only be achieved by governments putting in place any government infrastructure which allows then the citizens to be able to access government services directly from the comfort of their homes. It's supposed that you no know, the governments they cut or remove the middlemen and allow citizens to be able to access, to access government services 24/7 okay then yeah so i think it's, I, I really i think it's a it's a sin i think it's a crime with citizens, you have to travel so many kilometers to access government services that somebody catches a bus from a remote rural area to go and apply for a driver's license, a birth certificate, spend so much time in queues trying to access government services. So I think really it's important that our governments put systems in place whereby 24-7 from the comfort of my home, I'm able to access government services. Therefore, it's critical and urgent that African governments in implement e-government systems which allow our citizens to be able to access government services. Just imagine how much time can be saved where people can do all this from the comfort of their homes. If you need a birth certificate, if you need a driver's license, if I need any government service, I'm able to access it 24-7 from the comfort of my home. Therefore, it's important and critical that you know, we have in place e-government services. So um, we have different forms of e-government and different definitions. E-government has been defined probably as the use of ICTs to provide services to the government. There are various forms of interaction between government and citizens. It could be, it could be citizen to government, between government and government agencies, between government and employees, as well as between government and the business. And then there are various forms of how this can be done. As I've outlined before, that the challenges facing governments today is governments are inefficient, government services are difficult to access, it takes long to get, to get government services, you spend so much time queuing for government services, which leads to corruption, you have to pay for a middleman to, to jump the queue. And uh, each time I want to, actually I dread to access government service. If I lose my birth certificate, I actually dread and fear when I'm, when I'm, am I going to have it replaced, but so comes to get, to get government services. And therefore the demand is that, no, we need to have strong back of government systems, which is what we call e administration. Your financial management system in the background, your human resources management, your human resources management systems, your plan maintenance systems, which, are, uh, which allows you to maintain government equipment and the fleet management. It's also important that then we also have e-services and e-citizens, where citizens are able to access government services online in a real-time environment. And lastly, then from there, we have the government structures and various government communities being able to access and talk to each other in an online environment. That is basically what we call e-society. There are various stages and forms of e-government. Lean and Leeds defend four stages of e-government of e model. The basic one being a catalog, where you simply have an internet, where you can simply download a government form, passport application for a passport, you print it, you fill it manually, 
and then take it to the government office, submit it there, and then the civil service sitting behind the desk to process your application. And then we have the second form that allows a bit of transaction. We can upload the government form, fill it online, submit it, and they go to the government office for processing. Then, then we've got vertical integration. Where now basically you can apply for a government service online, you interact with the government online, you don't go to any government office, the government responds to you, you can check the status of the application online, the, when the document is ready, you are then asked you to come and pick it up. Then there's the horizontal, there's the, then there's the horizontal model, where besides applying to your government ministry, your government ministry can interact with other government agencies. For example, you have applied for, you, you have uh, applied for a government service, then there's need to verify and check with, central, with, with the central registry. Your government ministry then is able to check in the registry if your ID is correct. Then there's need for you to check with the deeds office, which is a separate ministry. The government can check if the deed data processing is correct and it really exists. So then that is what we call horizontal integration. And then, as I outlined before, that the government, they need to provide the enabling environment which allows citizens to be able to access government services. This then calls for co-creation. A citizen must be able, from the comfort of my home, to be able to access a government service. I'm applying for a birth certificate. I'm applying for a driver's license. I'm applying for a liquor license. I do this from the comfort of my home. By doing that, I have an environment where I can co-create with the government because I'm willingly, and because the service is readily available, I'm then probably there, I'm then able to access government services and then from there I help the government in terms of co-creation. What do we mean by co-creation? Co-creation basically comprises of three scenarios, or rather three entities working together. We have the customer who is the citizen at the center. And then we have the experts who are the consultants, in our case probably we as a service, service provider. We provide the system where we work with the government and provide a system that allows the government to provide the e-government e infrastructure. For example, this could be an SAP system. Then we have the government and its employees now accessing, providing that infrastructure, which provides citizens with a system to access government services online. So we have the expert interacting with the citizen, and then the expert providing the infrastructure to the government, and this being offered to the citizen. Then, then through the usage of that system, you can identify areas of improvement and thereby comes in and helps in co-creation and improvement of the service delivery. What are some examples of co-creation? In every day we work, we are co-creating. If I work with Microsoft Office 20, Microsoft has put in tools whereby if the system is slow, it's always the system that can identify the weaknesses. So, easy. so in a way, you're already co-creating with Microsoft. If you're playing the video games, with various levels of complexity, if the games are being won very easily, it means there is need to tighten up in terms of the complexity of the, of the game. If games are being difficult, nobody's winning, it means they are too complex. So then there's need to make them easier. So that's co-creation. There's co-creation even in our daily lives, if we're environment conscious. Where even now, if you go most places where you throw away garbage, you do the pre-sorting on your own. You say bottles in this bin, papers in this bin. Whereas in the, pre, in the past, the garbage collector himself would go and sort out the garbage when it gets to the, to the dumping ground. But already we are co-creating. So those are simple examples of co-creation. So what is public value? Public value is when the citizen is able to derive value from access, from access to government services. Where a citizen finds that government services is delivered efficiently, it's, it's available 24 hours, seven days a week, it's easy to access, I get feedback from the government. So there is value in terms of service delivery. And that from there encourages citizens to use the services. This will become part and parcel of the co-creation of the public value. And then, I just want to go then through to say, then how does then e-government enable citizens to participate in co-creating uh, services? 
we need to link the citizens directly with the service provider. Where we cut away the middlemen that sitting on your desk, you are able to apply for a government service online. Don't even go through the bureaucracy of going to a district office, provincial office, then waiting for feedback to come through the same channel. But you have access directly to the service provider. In this case now, we reduce the time of safe delivery. There's improved efficiency. It is available very easily and from the comfort of your home. So what we are saying then is the typical example where these things are working. In Zimbabwe, we've worked with the government of Zimbabwe, what, what, what we've called Zim Connect. Zim Connect allows the citizens to access government services in a real-time online environment. The project has been broken down into two, e-administration and the government portal. The government implemented an IFMIS system in 1998, which is supported by the SAP system. The system initially was mainly focusing on financial, on budgeting and accounting. And it also incorporates document management. We said a few having files in the offices, the electronic records across government. Then there are project systems in the back office, which allows basically the government to track all projects that are taking place in the country. So, so that given more the budget, the government can see projects by district, by village, by province, at the international level. There's plant management where the government manages the whole fleet of vehicles in terms of where are they going to to approve the travels of the employees. Then the back, then there is the citizen portal where citizens can access government services online. This thing from there is meant basically to have the full circle of the citizens from death to birth and track the whole life cycle of the citizens. What the government has done now, it, is, it established nine flagship projects as pilot, where citizens now are able to access government services. This was in terms of liquor license processing, companies and deeds registration, where you can register a company online without having to go to the government office. You can do your deeds search online, you do your company name search online, and you pay online. If you're applying for land, you can still or check with on land. It's all being done online. And through all this, you're able to pay from the comfort of your home. Through You can apply for government service using a mobile phone. You can apply for government service from your laptop, from your iPad, and be able to pay without having to go to a government office. The whole idea then is make sure to make the government efficient. What the government is trying to do is that now, as we talk now, we are rolling out this across the whole government, that all government services within the next two years, they must all be able to be provided online. I think the, the aim here is really that, no, there's no need for governments, citizens of the country, to be able to walk distances, local distances to access government services. I think the problem is that we always mourn and mourn about the resources, but you can hold the bull by the ones and take the initiative and make our governments user-friendly and allow citizens to access government services in the online retirement environment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Elman. Uh, this man should be given another round of applause. I think he gave us a very, very good expose. And I captured a number of things which uh, some are challenges to the audience. Um, Robert, how are we doing on time? We are doing very fine because I tried to do the best I could. I think we are doing really, really fine. Thank you very much. So I'll talk about a few things that I managed to capture and the challenges that his discussion throws to all of us uh, and get, us, get ourselves prepared for the, for the questions because they are, they are good challenges. Uh, his expose is specifically on prioritizing e-government. Very good topic. I've been involved in uh, implementing e-government in different countries in this region. Uh, there are places you go to, countries you go to today, when you begin talking about electronic government, they tell you this is not a priority. People do not have fresh water to drink. People do not have food. They don't have shelter. So we won't listen to you when you talk about electronic government. They could be right. But then electronic governance and ICT in general is an indispensable tool, enabler to service delivery 
you will rarely deliver your services if you can't be able to embrace the technologies that we have today that have changed and transformed our lives. So Elman was very, very strong and very clear and very eloquent and very accurate in everything he talked about prioritizing uh, e-government as government. And he talked about uh, e-administration, talked about e-citizens and e-society. And I, I actually didn't know how to, to make a difference between the three, but he was very, very clear on that. And his clarity has helped me to understand what uh, the three mean. He talked about stages of electronic governance, the horizontal, the vertical, the transactional, and the catalog, which was very good. I want to share with you uh, experience, a personal experience, and very, very fast in the interest of time. One time I, I was traveling to, to Europe, and when I arrived and landed in Brussels, there had been a strike of uh, train drivers. They were trying to campaign for a higher pay. And when you get at the airport, and you look at how much money you pay for a taxi to get you from Brussels National to the first station in CBD in Brussels, the, the price is, 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 is very high. You could pay up to 150 euros, while you could only pay eight euros by train. But there had been a train, a train strike. I didn't know what to do. So I had friends of mine from Africa that we had traveled together. When we got there, everyone was putting in his ticket number that they give you, put it on a machine, and the machine would give you a ticket for the train. But most of us hadn't used these machines before. And for the next two hours, we had people pass by the queue and leaving us there staring at these machines. And they were getting in the train and they are going to their destinations. These are some of the things that electronic governance gives us. And when you talk, you talk about uh, public value, public value. There was an issue talking about how can government make it possible for citizens to use services. That making services available is one thing, but having citizens to use services is another. And how can you make citizens access and use the services responsibly and more efficiently for their own, for their own benefit? And the answer could go same way and say, if today we stood up as one and say there is no more payment of taxes by any other means apart from online. If we stood up today and we said for any transaction that you have to do, you have to use mobile money. And that now mobile money account is mandatory. This is going to drive, this is going to make citizens use the technologies that we have all embraced. And this is exactly how we can prioritize, in my view. But from the audience, I think you'll be having more, more uh, uh, contribution to this. Um, help me to welcome our next presenter. Uh, she is going to be talking a case study on e-government imp implementation strategies in Rwanda, specifically in Rwanda. And this is uh, uh, Paula Ingabire. She's head of ICT de uh, department at the Rwanda Development Board. Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, if you realize uh, the ladies on this panel opted not to do PowerPoint presentations, so I'll not disappoint my former panelists. <laughs> we'll leave it to the gentlemen. Um, I'll be talking about uh, Rwanda's case study uh, in the implementation of e-government strategy. Our journey has been an interesting one uh, and a worthwhile one for the last 15 years from a formerly uh, inexistent uh, industry to being one of the top um, contributors to our GDP. Today uh, we contribute about 3% uh, of our GDP. As I said, uh, it's been a journey of 15 years. It started in, uh, in 2000 when we put out the National Information and Communication Infrastructure Strategy, which was our national ICT strategy. And uh, it was a four, five year rolling plan 
which uh, for the first five years focused uh, on putting in place uh, the right institutional frameworks and reforms. And uh, the other five years, which was 2006 to 2010, was putting in place the right infrastructure, which is uh, an underpinning uh, factor for uh, e-government within our country. And the third one, which is where we are at today, uh, was looking to develop the service sector, having e-government as a key pillar um, as a key pillar of the strategy. Some of our achievements can be broken down into, uh, uh, into different categories. When we look at infrastructure, today we have uh, 3G coverage of about 60% geographical coverage. Uh, and that is collective for the different uh, service providers that we have in the industry. Uh, as you are aware, uh, we also have uh, moved on to 4G. We now have 4G covering the entire Kigali. And for some of our guests here today, we do hope you can stay a little bit longer until 1st April to, to see us launch, uh, the, uh, launch 4G coverage within the other four major secondary cities within Rwanda. We have uh, the national uh, backbone, fiber optic backbone network that is covering um, over, over 3,000 kilometers uh, of the country and touching all the districts within the country and the border points. We've also put in place uh, the national data center as well as a disaster recovery center that offers business continuity services for most of the clients that we have. And that spans uh, from just government institutions to the private sector as well. The other achievements, if I bundle them together, uh, we are looking at content and application. In terms of e-government and in order to ensure that our objective of achieving improved service delivery is achieved, one of the things that we've embarked on as a government is to put in place uh, a government enterprise architectural framework. And uh, this is a master plan that we use while developing and deploying uh, applications and solutions across government. Um, this was critical uh, for purposes of, of interoperability, but also to reduce the duplication that was happening across the various government institutions that were deploying various technologies to improve on their business processes. The other one, a case in point, was uh, the document tracking and workflow system, which we use to improve information sharing within government. This is a centralized system that connects the different uh, information systems that we have in government and improves uh, the way information is shared in, uh, within institutions, but also helps to track uh, how information is shared across government institutions. Today, uh, we, entered into, um, we entered into an agreement with one of the leading service providers in our sector to deploy an e-procurement system that looks to streamline all our procurement processes within government. I could go on and on on the various applications that uh, we've, de we've developed as government, but the key ones that uh, we've, we've highlighted in terms of e-government, we have a government command center. This is a system that we've put in place to actually um, track progress of government implementation programs. Now, this is the first uh, in the region. It's a robust system that supports in the decision-making processes um, that, we, that, that, that the government is involved in. And very notably, we have uh, a project run online, and, and I'll not steal the show for my colleague, Clema, who is coming right after me. I'll let him talk about run online. But just one thing I want to talk about, it's, it's the first ever public-private partnership project that government of Rwanda has entered into to deliver some of its services. It's an exciting one because, as I said in the beginning, the main focus of the national ICT strategic plan that we are in this, within this particular phase is more about service delivery, about the partnerships and synergies that we draw uh, in implementing some of these initiatives. And for us, it's a plus to have, uh, to have these kinds of partnerships ha happening between government and, um, and the private sector. And lastly, within the section of content and applications development, we have what we, a homegrown initiative we, that we call Vision. Uh, this initiative is geared towards increasing device penetration uh, within the country. Now, uh, this, uh, I've been talking more or less about the achievements, but just to wind up my presentation, as a government, we're entering into the very last phase of, um, of, of our ICT for development implementation efforts. 
and we've dubbed that uh, the Smart Rwanda strategy. This is already underway and has been developed and we should start implementation within the following year. But uh, what we are going to be focusing on within the, within the Smart Rwanda strategy is to ensure that you have 24-hour self-service uh, um, uh, provision for government services. We want to have all the government services online by uh, the year 2018. We want to have a cashless and paperless government, and that's an objective that we want to achieve by uh, by the year of 2018. And this is strongly ingrained in our in our Smart Rwanda strategy. We also are looking to create over 100,000 jobs uh, for, for for within the ICT sector, but also this is going to foster an enabling environment for the private investments that we are trying to attract. Also, I did mention at the beginning of my presentation uh, where the, the sector today is contributing about 3% uh, to our GDP, but the intention with this new uh, Smart Rwanda strategy is that we contribute about 5% to the GDP, but this is going to be mainly the, the initiatives that are embedded within the Smart Rwanda strategy. And we intend to at least achieve efficiency gains that are equivalent to about 25 million US dollars. And all this was calculated based on some of the key programs and initiatives that we have, uh, that we have within uh, our smart uh, government strategy. There's one thing I'd wanted to mention, and maybe later on when we have some interactions, uh, one, of, one of the flagship projects that we've had, e-government projects that we've had, is the national ID, where uh, we have over 97 percent of the people eligible for an ID who have already received this ID. But it doesn't stop at that. This was just an ID that was issued, but what we want to achieve going forward, and this is going to be done with this, uh, within this year, is a smart card that puts together uh, about seven applications. It will include one's personal ID details, your health insurance details, your social security details, uh, um, passport details, should have your tax identification details as well. It should have your family dependence for those with children. So this is a card that will have about seven applications that you, you'll be able to use for the various services that you'll be looking for. And this is an initiative that we intend to have launched within this financial year uh, if everything goes according to plan. So in a nutshell, that is our, that, that's the journey that we are on as a, as a government uh, or as the citizens of Rwanda. There's more to do and, and more of it is ingrained within the Smart Rwanda strategy that we will embark on within the next year. Thank you very much. I don't know the last time they called me to give a presentation that I came without any PowerPoint presentation that I'm able to do as well as, as, as Paula has done. You know, this is the, something I like about our industry. When you're in, into it, you get passion, you know, and it's that passion that drives you to perform. I'll share a very small personal experience, which goes again to what I just said and what Paul has just given us. Some time ago, and you know, when, when you have these journeys and you're moving from one country to another and you're always mindful about the next person who'll be seated next to you for the next eight hours on that long plane, so it's always good luck that you get someone who you get along with, right? So I happen to be on this very long journey uh, between Europe and, and US for a training course. And someone was seated to me and then he asked me, he said, what do you do? After I introduced myself, he said, what do you do? I said, well, I am in computers. I'm a computer scientist. He didn't say a word for the next one minute or so. And I asked him, I said, what do you do? Before he could tell me what he does, he asked me, said, how crazy can you be to be in computer science? And when I looked at him, I said, but the whole world is going computer. This guy must be crazy. So I said, well, tell me what you do. And he told me he moves around the world visiting graveyards. He goes to graveyards. And this was the craziest. I, I, I felt exactly the same way like he felt when I told him computers. And I asked him, I said, what, for, for heaven's sake, what do you do in graveyards? Why do you go through graveyards? And he told me, he said he was a writer. 
and there is a lot of knowledge that is lost while people live their journeys on earth. And so what he does is that he visits graveyards, reads on the gravestone the time and death of someone, the time of birth and death, and he goes to local libraries finding out about personalities. And what he does, he writes books about those people, and when he's lucky and gets a publisher, he gets a lot of money. And he told me that he wrote 12 books before he could get a publisher. And when he got one, it sold 17 million copies. I found myself the craziest person on earth being in computers. Because <laughs> I haven't got a fraction of that. So thank you, Paula, for having given us that expose with a lot of passion. It's very good. Uh, so I will not go through a lot of what she said because that would be diluting um, her very strong uh, expose on Rwanda's journey uh, towards uh, equitable uh, IT and uh, electronic governance and the sustainability, the viability, the processes, uh, the biggest, the first ever private-public uh, partnership that Kremer is just about to talk about. I will not talk about it, I promise you, because you have the entire 15 minutes to tell us about this uh, private-public partnership miracle that has happened to Rwanda. I like the, the Visio, the device penetration, which we are trying to work around. Uh, the smart Rwanda strategies, which are really, really nice, um, we, and which I think are beginning next year. Uh, we will be having a lot of questions coming through, um, and I can see one of my mentors in ICT who is in our midst, uh, Senator Gasama Jirawiraus, he's, he's here with us. He's uh, one of uh, my mentors and, and, and a mentor of very many people. He's been very anxious to ask questions. We will limit you to two, I promise you. Thank you very much, and may I now welcome uh, one of our uh, last but not least, uh, presenters, uh, who happens to be my boss, is the first uh, vice president for the ICT chamber, uh, Clement Wajeneza, chief executive officer, Rwanda Online. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so, Randa Online uh, and Randa Online Platform Limited is a private company that has entered in a 25-year uh, public-private partnership with the government of Rwanda to put services online. And our mission is to build a platform that allows uh, and enables online and automated uh, provision of services to citizens and businesses. Uh, we have very precise goals. towards there that I, okay. All right, all right, it's good. Sorry, I'll stand here. All right, please. Thanks. Um, our first goals is to be citizen-centric, and uh, when we are thinking uh, of digitizing services, making sure that the, the life of our citizens are improved through faster, easier, and less costly access to government services. Our second goal, uh, which is uh, it's equally as important, and given the aspect of our business, which is uh, based on a revenue share with the government on, the, on this government to citizens and government to business services, is to really achieve true efficiency for the government. That means each service we digitize, we truly uh, create uh, cost saving for the government. We make it more efficient uh, to deliver and uh, to deliver it faster to the citizen. And then thirdly, which is uh, uh, the beauty of being in a public-private partnership for 25 years, is to achieve uh, sustainability for our business so that we continuously innovate around this service, uh, online service provision. And um, uh, this sustainability will allow us to constantly have state-of-the-art technology uh, to deliver government services as new technology come in. Uh, like Paula mentioned, when we have the smart card, for example, uh, rolled out across the country, it, it will trigger new innovation and new ways of delivering service, and that allows us to constantly align and, uh, and uh, evolve our systems to e continuously achieve the two 
first goals, citizens, uh, improved life, and uh, business efficiency. Next. So uh, what we are building, I wanted to share with you first, uh, well, we have two aspects of our business. First, the technology side. And secondly, how we approach service delivery and actually rolling out the technology so that each citizen uh, perceives true change in how service is delivered. Uh, our core product that we are building, the Rwanda Online platform, um, is going to integrate uh, the most important things that one needs to have for a service to go online. First, the main registries. When you are providing a, a service to a citizen, you need to identify him. We need to be connected to the people registry. When you're providing a service to a business, you need to be connected to the business registry. Uh, when you need to access services that involve land, you need to be connected to the land registry and all other services. But you also need to have what we call common services uh, like authentication services. How do you uh, authentify? We, we, do we authentify you with the most securely way possible uh, while protecting your privacy as much as possible? Uh, notification services for you to constantly be aware of where the delivery of your service is, uh, is uh, at, at which stage? And uh, payment service uh, which allows you to pay online so that you do not have to do an additional trip to go make your payments. And then finally, the most important uh, piece being the back office integration, because uh, what Rwanda Online is building is building the front end, uh, which is the, the interaction between the citizen and the, the channels to, to accessing government services. But when we capture the, the application process, we need to send it to uh, the, the institution back, back office uh, system that processes now that application and delivers you the actual document. So that's a part of our core products. When that's done, we are going to put uh, 100 uh, government services online within a period of uh, three years. We actually have uh, 10 services that are coming uh, online in June, and then other will be coming out every th three months, uh, six, three to six months. For the, the next three years, we will have uh, put online 100 services. Of course, we will continue to having uh, other government services coming to our platform through uh, third party developers by allowing them to connect to our core product which makes it faster to uh, put services online. We expect when we have our platform ready to really enable anyone, any developer to put a new government services online within a period of one week to a maximum of four weeks. Next. Uh, but then how do we approach uh, putting online these 100 services? So we see each service uh, actually as a product. So uh, each service has different uh, aspects, uh, different aspects on who are the people who consume that service, uh, what is the business around that service, um, that means uh, laws, around the laws and regulations around that services, how, uh, who gets involved during that services, what are the different government institutions that are uh, involved within providing that specific services, etc. And then by uh, looking at those three, we look at the technology that is already available on the market, which one can allow us to deliver this service and reduce to the maximum the, the, the time, the, the number of trips, the cost that the citizen or the business incur to receiving that uh, service. I'd like to give two examples on the uh, um, among the two services we are going to put online first. The one is uh, when someone applies for a driving license, to pass a driving license test. Uh, most of the people who apply for driving license are uh, educated. Um, uh, there is a high penetration of, uh, of mobile. Uh, most of them, a big percentage, uh, have access to a mobile phone, at least a feature phone. Uh, and uh, are used to use USSD either for mobile money applications or SMSs. Actually, as of today, uh, it was already the case when you completed the driver license uh, test application, you interact with SMS to know when to go uh, past the exam and where to go past the exam. Uh, secondly, the business around it, of course, it's provided by traffic police, which has been putting in place, uh, and the police in general have been putting in place a number of systems internally to process this kind of services. Uh, driving schools are involved because they sometimes will uh, 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 subscribe students for, uh, to pass tests. 
but we also have testing centers or testing areas. Uh, that's where when we have provided the, the service, the, uh, the, the end result is someone being at a testing center and uh, passing his driving license test. And finally, the technology available, uh, USSD of a mobile phone, mobile applications, or online. So when we uh, looked at everything around these services, we thought that, uh, and uh, considering that the only information we need from the, the applicant is actually only his ID number, because when he provides us with his ID number, we can have all the details due to our integration with the people registry, uh, and we need just his ID number and for him to pay uh, to pass the test. So this service, we put it online, but through USSD. Um, using USSD, one can only uh, put in his ID, apply for the service, and then pay using his mobile money account. Zero trip to, to do it, whereas as of today, he needed to do two to three trips and uh, incur a cost of 1,200 almost. Second example is uh, a trade license. So it's, a, or what we call it in, in Rwanda, patent is a, the sm a small fee license that you need to, to use when you have a small shop. Most of the people who access this uh, service are within uh, high density business areas, markets, um, high um, uh, density market areas like Nyabugogo, Osuno, uh, Kigali. So we thought that delivering this service, which requires sometimes uploading documents and more, uh, um, um, a more complex uh, uh, application process, we are uh, entering into a partnership with access points agents because we already have people providing agency banking within those areas, for example. And these people will also be uh, uh, access point agents and uh, service provision agents for Rwanda Online. Uh, therefore, bringing the application of this service and the whole process closer to the, to the people. So uh, basically, this is how we approach our um, uh, run online uh, project. Um, and, uh, and we think uh, in the next, uh, well, three years when we will have uh, put all these services online, we will really have achieved our two main goals, which is to make life uh, improved for the citizens and businesses, but also making government more efficient in terms of cost to deliver services. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Clement. I can't go back through everything you said, and uh, I think this is a very exciting project, people. Uh, some of us who are in the private sector, we know what this means to us when you have to struggle each time to look for a tender and you're flipping through the pages of newspapers every morning to look for that tender, now, Crema is just a call away. It just says, we have this available for you to design. So can you please bring your skills here? So I think this is, this is very good. We are moving into um, uh, a question session. Um, I am very, very limited with time and I can see most of you are beginning to not appreciate my standing here uh, many times. So without wasting too much time, may I ask uh, all the presenters to come in front and we shall begin um, the question session. We are limiting questions to two per person. So we will be having questions for Clement, for, uh, for um, and the rest of the people, I can't have their names on. But while that happens, let's throw this challenge to the three of you. I have three major things that I, I realized from this session. And I think this is a challenge to all of us. How do we determine ICT's position in the government priority list? Because if you talk to government, government will tell you, every sector they do is a priority. Education, healthcare, social security, um, infrastructure, electricity, water, everything is a priority. So in this session, how do we make sure that ICT on that priority list gets the position it deserves? And this is a challenge to all of us. Challenge number two. How do we create sustainable public-private partnerships? Because we all are serving one master, and our master is the citizen. 
So how do we make sure that we collaborate and create the cohesion that is necessary in working together and use the tools collectively to deliver on citizen service? And the three, the third, has actually technology reduced the cost of citizen access to services or has it increased it? For a Maasai or for the other nomadic person living very far away and he's always grazing his cattle and looking after his animals, is owning that mobile phone to be able to access uh, any citizen service uh, cheaper or it's expensive? This is for us to think through and we see, are we designing the technologies that are working for our citizens? So, uh, members of the plenary, now this is the, the question session. I have someone who is going to be uh, moving back and forth and I will begin taking your questions. Do we have anyone in the house? Okay. And we are limiting to maximum two minutes in the interest of that meal. Thanks very much. Is uh, my name warming is Bob, Bob Akello. Uh, I, I was in a plane, and I think it relates to what the panelists, uh, sorry, the moderator has just said. And I was reading a book written, uh, I saw a book written, Nigger Capitalist. Can you speak louder? Can you speak I was reading a book in the plane yesterday, uh, written, or titled Nigger Capitalist. Um, and it relates to what the moderator has just said. How do you moderate between the agents of the main players in this game, our local agents, the main players, and government, because I'll go back to my earlier word, corruption. The agents, our local agents, are conduits for corruption. How do you handle this, especially in Rwanda? Thank you. And this question is directed towards who? Who are you directing your question? Uh, that's to uh, uh, Paula. Uh, Paula, you have uh, a minute and a half, two minutes to answer to that question. Um, thank you. Um, beyond what we do as the ICT sector, uh, the government has put in place uh, mechanisms for curbing corruption. And these are quite beyond what we do um, uh, as a sector, uh, as a technology-led sector. Now, uh, there are certain instruments, there are both legal instruments and incentives that have been put in place by the government of Rwanda to ensure that you have uh, zero corruption in the various transactions that government engages in with, uh, with, uh, with what you call the local agents. However, uh, when we try to marry it with, um, with what technology can do, it's not a secret uh, that with the introduction of technology in, in, in business transactions, there's an element of corruption that is eliminated because technology brings uh, an element of transparency in the way we conduct business. With that element of transparency, it's, it's embedded in the way we optimize the processes, the services that we provide. Because if, if, you, do not, um, if, if you do not pay particular attention in the planning and designing of how you automate the services for government, then there's still going to be room for corruption. So the way we design the processes, the way we design the services always, uh, always gives us an element of transparency when we, uh, when we roll out some of these programs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. I think that's uh, satisfactory. Like uh, Minister uh, from Uganda had told us, technology is not the answer to corruption, uh, but mindset is going to be the answer to corruption. Um, may uh, we have someone, uh, Senator Gassama Jira uh Director General RMI, in our midst, he has a question, and I think it's very burning. Thank you, moderator. Um, actually, mine is just a reflection around the three points you have thrown to us, and uh, just a simple uh, question that I will uh, 
uh, addressed to Clement. Uh, well, uh, positioning ICT in uh, government priority, uh, I say it for having lived the experience, it has much to do with championship. When you have a champion who has it in mind, then ICT is given a good position. I say it uh, basing on, uh, on our case in Rwanda here. Our president is the first champion of ICT and he made things move. If I go back to the time we were still struggling to uh, set up paperless parliament, uh, that was uh, three, uh, four to five years ago when I was still in parliament, uh, we had to deal with people who are resisting very much. Uh, and what actually worked out was simply because there was a determination by the leadership we had by then, the institutional leadership, and then uh, uh, ICT was given top priority and we could achieve a paperless parliament which is running very smoothly even now, even today. Um, I see that you are pushing me, I know there is no time. Has technology reduced the cost or increased it? This is a question I would like Clement to tell us a little bit about. Uh, when when I, we talk of cost, it is not just only money. It is the cost in time, the cost in comfort. You know, uh, back to my, my colleagues in parliament, uh, it was very uncomfortable for them just simply to be forced to work on computer. They were, of course, they were what we call here in this country, BBC, those people who were born before computer. Um, so cost in comfort and cost in attitude. You know, when you are compelled every time to look at these small fonts on, over your, your screen, things like that. So Kalima, could you please tell us, you who are uh, uh, so much involved in practicals of, of ICTs. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, with due respect, uh, let's, uh, Clema, uh, is, it, uh, is technology going to cut cost or is it going to increase cost? Thank you. Uh, well, we see cost reduction in, uh, in the case of Rwanda Online at two levels. First, uh, well, cost re reduction for the person who accesses the service. Um, and the, it's the service consumer and then cost reduction for the, the, the service provider. How do you reduce cost and the, the processes on providing this service so that the cost is reduced? So when we approach each service at Rwanda Online, we look at really, uh, well, we want to understand the, 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 the citizen and what he needs to go through to get or to access that service. And if, for example, he was to do three trips, first going to to, to, to get the, the forms, second going to, to uh, apply for the service, and then third going to a bank to pay for the service, and we can just uh, reduce, and, and fourth trip going to, to get the actual service or the, the final document, we try to reduce this number of trips to a maximum. Now, uh, when we say we put these services online, there is uh, putting them online um, for people to access them directly on a computer. We understand that, uh, uh, well, access to a computer and the penetration uh, at this moment in Rwanda is less than, uh, is about 20%. So um, when we look at a service, we try to see if it's simple or we can make it simple enough for it to even be accessible on a, small, on a, on a feature phone device. Uh, which would now allow 70% uh, allow of Rwandans to access it directly on a phone. Of course, we, we estimate or we think or we believe that uh, if we, put, we make services as simple as possible and actually it becomes um, uh, simple and, uh, to use and access and very user-friendly, like actually the experience we have with mobile money now, you, you can complete almost any banking transaction on mobile money on a feature phone, and people have adopted it because it's so relevant to them, then we believe that people will adopt it, it will be easy, and will reduce the, num the, the, the cost to, to accessing this service. Thank you, Clement. That was very nice. I think Catherine wants to contribute to that because of her nomadic uh, uh, 
our nomadic people that live in those rural areas sometimes with no access to uh, to roads and stuff. So, Catherine, do you want to say something about that too? One minute, please. Thank you. Um, well, I think uh, ICT can either increase or reduce the cost. That's a very political answer, but uh, I think it depends on the way it's implemented. Yeah, We know that there are a high number of failed ICT projects globally, and uh, obviously somebody pays for that, who is the taxpayer, and that, you know, that, so it costs money. And that's why we're advocating for um, private public partnerships to answer your other questions so that we can share the risk. Um, and it is also why we're advocating for good planning, good collaboration, good capacity building so that ICT doesn't uh, raise the cost of uh, doing business, but makes it, maybe not lowering, but makes it cost effective. Because as somebody has said, it offers opportunities which go beyond just uh, the cost. Thank you very much, Jean-Jacques. In the, in, the in the 11 minutes I have left, um, Jean-Jacques, you talked about the toolkit, uh, not about just strategies, but should be about implementation. Where in your toolkit is that highlighted? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, moderator. First, uh, I, I will add that you have to, to take care of the time frame. If you want to see if ICT or new technologies can decrease generally the cost, because you have the software cost, uh, production, uh, capacity, building, training, all these things. But in the middle term, it always decreases. If you take an example for mobile users, of course, if you are uh, two million people using a mobile device, interconnection cost will decrease. That's why now even in, a, in a SADEC, there is no more in interconnection fees among operators, because it, the more you are using the service, the more uh, it will cost uh, a small amount of money uh, by, 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 by capita or by person. So now, uh, to your question, uh, uh, we need in Africa, because uh, studies is good, but uh, I used to say uh, we are now in a civil uh, society, we are no more at school. We are no more at school. Uh, and uh, as we said, we have people living uh, BBC, we have a born with computers, but not using them properly. We have a born with all these uh, iPhones and so on, but using them just for leisure, uh, for other application, not for uh, education, not uh, uh, for capacity building. So I think what is important is the readiness assessment. Uh, don't go without planning. The exercise needs first the readiness assessment, and that's the purpose of this toolkit. The first part of it, of this implementation, is the readiness assessment. And you see all the, the four layers, infrastructure first. Uh, after, you can move uh, to give services to citizens and so on, uh, which is the last layer of it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Jacques has given us a very nice uh, insight on economies of scale. The more you use, the more people get, get connected, the more traffic you generate, the, the more the price goes down. So in, in the long term, the price will fall down which is a very good thing, and of course, uh, readiness and assessment. I'll take more questions. Uh, two more questions I have. Andrew, at the back, Andrew. Thank you very much. Uh, my can, you question stand up, can you stand up, then we see you? Thank you. My name is Ari Jambo Andrew, and uh, I want to get my question to the 23rd Century Systems CEO. Uh, you did mention to us that uh, you mostly utilize SAP-related technologies. Is that, is that correct? SAP. Yes, it is. Uh, I just uh, wanted you to give us uh, an insight, a little bit of an insight, in how you deal with uh, the learning curve. Because SAP has those issues. Most people who try SAP fail in our usual problems of having to have the engineers accumulated in numbers to be able to manage their systems. And also, maybe you could touch on the way in which you manage to deal with integrations of other people who use other systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I think first of all, uh, knowledge transfer is critical to any implementation. So when implementing a system, I think from day one, there must be a plan to transfer knowledge so that people will be able to use the system once it has gone live. I don't think CSAP is complicated, but one, you must have a comprehensive plan in terms of transferring knowledge. I've talked about that the government of Zimbabwe basically running SAP. And today, if you type, you know, org, you will see, the, you come face to face with the SAP portal, which allows all Zimbabwe citizens to access government services online. But the whole system is made simple. It runs simple, it's simplified. We have three or four or five screens only which makes it easy for people to learn and to use the system. So knowledge transfer is critical. Then certainly in terms of integration, the government again is, is running SAP wall to wall. So the, the back office is SAP, the front office is SAP, the middleware uh, CRM is SAP. So SAP is fully integrated. So basically the integration comes standard. But where there are none SAP systems which are part of the, of, of, of the whole infrastructure, SAP, again, technology allows for seamless integration with non-SAP systems. And again, to manage that as well, we use the SAP business intelligence or SAP business objects, which manages big, which manages big data. So it allows them from there to integrate SAP and non-SAP systems. It makes, it makes the integration very simple. Thank you very much. I think uh, that was very nice. Um, we'll have another question before that. Uh, before that, I think, uh, Paula, uh, you may also rely on some uh, expertise from Tony or someone else. Uh, this is about cloud computing, which is it's a question that just came in about cloud computing. Uh, and someone is asking and saying how safe is going to be our, da our data and how is a cyber security response team of Rwanda uh, managing uh, the potential cyber attacks uh, so that we look at cloud computing as a viable and potential, uh, uh, as necessary uh, way to share our data. But before you answer that, uh, we have a lady. We finally have a lady at the back. Uh, okay. Thank you. My name is Sylvie. I work at RDB. I'm in charge of uh, standard and policy. Uh, I'm going to talk about something which is not common in the technology world. Is, is it a question? Is it a... I don't know how people will take it if it's a question because maybe other countries will tell us about okay. the experience. It's uh, the human right perspective on embracing technology. Um, how are the government bringing on board citizens uh, when coming up with new technologies? Because we should see if behind that there is no... We may think we are doing good, but we are harming people. Uh, do we have, before implementing any solution, uh, provision on how people will friendly embrace those technology or we are frustrating them behind that that is a human rights issue I don't know how other countries are doing I wanted to thank you thank you very about much. I, I think that question is for Jean Jacques I think he's a he's a man who has the scorecard for for performance on on those issues so we will take uh, uh, Paula first and then we will do Jean Jacques um, uh, thank you. I, I think uh, inevitably everyone will expect what my answer is going to be. <laughs> it's like going to a shop and asking the products how good they are. But let me take this opportunity to sell, uh, to sell some of uh, the services and initiatives that we have. Now, I, I think the first question was to do with the cloud computing infrastructure uh, and how safe it is and how safe uh, you know, government and private sector data that is hosted within our internet data center is. Now, straight to the point, uh, we, have, uh, we have tools that have been put in place. It's a robust infrastructure that has been built, and we have adequate tools that help us to secure uh, the, the cloud computing infrastructure. And this is not just the cloud computing infrastructure, it's the entire internet uh, data center that we have. Uh, in, a, in addition to the tools we've put in place, our cyber uh, security uh, response team that also has, has uh, first they have the skills and the tools to, to monitor uh, and prevent any possible attacks that they are able to be able that they are able to trace. But beyond just monitoring and preventing them, we also have tools that have been put in place and systems that have been put in place to be able to, to guard and, uh, and, and, and address the attacks, the attacks that we've managed to, that, 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 have, uh, 
that have managed to come on some of the platforms that of government systems that we are hosting. Now, I, I think I'll keep it as short as that. Yes, we, we, we have a very 24-hour uh, a, a, a team that works 24 hours that is highly skilled to, to provide uh, these cyber prevention um, uh, services, cyber, cyber threats prevention services. But beyond just the team, we also have a robust infrastructure and tools and systems in place that support the team in their day-to-day -day activities. Thank you, Paul. That was very nice. Um, Mr. Jean-Jacques, um, how do we yes. make sure that the, the technologies we embrace yes. today First, to, do not to, to ensure the people and to complete uh, Rwanda Development Board, but uh, uh, the fight against the cyber terrorism is not uh, uh, the task of one, one country only. Cyber attacks can come from anywhere. And so there is this impact uh, coalition, which is the international coalition to, to fight against cyber crime. And, uh, among these efforts, national efforts, this uh, task force built in Rwanda is linked to, to our uh, World Center. And I'm happy to announce to you that in the region in, in Nigeria, uh, there will be the African Regional Center uh, based on the same uh, technological level than the one in Singapore, uh, which is dealt with uh, the, the coalition, what we call the impact coalition to fight against uh, cyber crime and uh, cyber terrorism. So now coming to the people with disabilities. Of course, yes, there is a lot of tools. In ITU, we have uh, some specific... No, I think it's about infringement, uh, technologies infringement on, on universal human rights. Universal? Human rights. Yes, but you, she was saying what efforts are made okay. for people uh, with uh, disabilities and so on, which is the human rights problem for uh, what we call a, a free and uh, inclusive. Uh, participation in the, the information society of, of, of our, uh, our brothers and sisters. Uh, the tools are there. We have a lot of tools developed, uh, even in ITU uh, study group uh, questions. Uh, we have uh, some tools for uh, the access for blind people and so on. We, the, the software are developed. And of course, it's now a national policy uh, who should be put in place uh, in order to allow these people to access as the other users uh, in terms of rights, you have the rights of uh, people with disabilities, we have the right of the children. So human rights are uh, starting from COP, child online protection, until, until the, the senior. You are because these seniors, which are uh, uh, what you call uh, uh, BBC, born before this computer, uh, they need to be trained uh, because uh, they are living with uh, some parents and relatives who are using these tools, so we, we need to train all these people and uh, to have an inclusive uh, society. But of course, there is tools for that. If you need some details, I can give more details on that. Thank you very much. Details will be coming after that. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, Tony, I think you had something to say. Do, do you have a question? Uh, microphone? Uh, Tony is right there. He, he wanted to say something about... Uh, yeah, sharing with us something about uh, cloud computing. Just yes. yeah. there. No, there. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I just wanted to supplement a little bit on Polar. Is uh, to say that uh, the, the best security is when you are removing completely your computer from the network, any network, the local internet. As long as you have it online, whether it is in your bedroom or under your bed, it is still accessible by cyber threat. And what we've been able to do is consolidate uh, the infrastructure, the investment to have, uh, to have a much robust security level. Another thing I wanted to highlight is uh, when you are doing an investment in the cloud, you have to look beyond the capital investment and think on the total cost of investment. You have your computer, you have to pay for electricity, you have to pay for the staff. And when you do the comparison, clouds uh, definitely shows a much better option. And because the whole industry now is going toward the clouds, they are able to provide much better security than what people think uh, are achieving by keeping uh, uh, server in-house. It's a simple analogy as having money in the bank and money under your mattress. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, uh, organizers, for leaving me with the last two minutes. I'll take questions. Uh, one last question. Uh, yes, we have someone from uh, CSAT. Uh, yes, Charles. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Charles Mugisha. I have just uh, one simple question addressed to to the CEO of 21st Century uh, System. He presented a very nice system which ensure the whole uh, information sharing and management cycle. My question is, how do you ensure the authenticity of electronic documents which are getting shared and its integrity? Uh, another question can go to the representative of ITU. What are the strategy uh, ITU is putting in place to make sure that electronic document crossing the borders, people can uh, authenticate them, can ensure their authenticity and integrity. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think Paul just have to talk about the experience of the government of Zimbabwe. That if they, if you are submitting documents online, there are documents that are required. For example, say if you are applying for a license, liquor license. You need to submit your company registration. You need to submit a copy of your ID. The record of your ID is sitting within the government systems already. So if you submit it, just by punching your ID number, they can check if it exists. Because the systems are fully integrated. The central registry and the, and the, and the local licensing board. And then they also want to check your company registration again by company, just typing your company number. Because the company registration is part of that integrated system. Just by punching that number, the document will pop up and see that it, it, it exists as well. So both systems are fully integrated. Authentication is very easy. Both the systems, both documents have got ideas. So that's how they check the, the, all the authenticity of the documents. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll be winding up. Um, housekeeping, uh, Robert, wherever you are. Uh, we just have one... Um, an answered question, uh, which is good, which is uh, still outstanding, uh, collaboration between government and private sector in infrastructure sharing, and um, I would like to, uh, with a lot of respect, invite uh, or ask um, uh, Honourable Minister of ICT from Burundi to tell us how best can we. Um, can we work together, private and public? You can say that in French. We'll have some people to translate that. Thank you. How do we create the cohesion that is required to make sure that private and public partnership can share the infrastructure for the benefit of citizens? Je m'excuse, je n'ai pas suivi euh, euh, pour euh, comprendre d'où est venue votre question, mais je, euh, je me dis que le secteur des... Can we ask Clema to, to translate the question uh, to just uh, in French, the question? Um, la question était comment, comment le... Euh, public <laughs> sector, uh, le secteur public et le secteur privé peuvent partager les, les infrastructures pour mieux bénéficier les citoyens. Oui, merci de la question. Euh, je pense que d'abord, il faut que au niveau, au niveau, au niveau euh, du gouvernement, euh, au niveau de l'État, donc de, des plus hautes institutions on puisse euh, euh, prendre conscience qu'effectivement qu le secteur des TIC ne peut pas se développer sans l'implication euh, du secteur privé. Euh, et je pense qu'à ce niveau, euh, il y a, euh, donc le gouvernement doit mettre à contribution le secteur privé, que ce soit euh, d'abord dans la définition de la politique euh, nationale des TIC euh, pour que euh, d'abord le secteur privé puisse effectivement euh, apporter sa contribution dans la définition de cette politique parce que nous avons déjà constaté que euh, 
souvent, c'est au niveau des États, les gouvernements euh, peuvent commettre cette erreur euh, en définissant la politique sans prendre en compte euh, les, 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 la vie, la vie de la, du secteur privé. Et au niveau de l'implémentation, au niveau de la mise en œuvre de la politique, il faut aussi mettre à contribution le secteur privé. Et cela euh, euh, nécessite qu'il y ait un cadre légal et institutionnel qui soit clair. Au niveau du cadre légal, il faut des textes assez clairs. Euh, là, je pense notamment euh, aux lois sur les transactions électroniques, aux lois sur euh, les communications électroniques, et des postes qui aujourd'hui euh, vont ensemble, euh, surtout au niveau de, du contrôle et de la régulation. Euh, que ce soit aussi au niveau de l'agrément, euh, le cadre institutionnel, il faut que on puisse savoir qui fait quoi et à quel moment pour éviter, euh, oui, de, 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 euh, un certain nombre de, 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 de lacunes qu'on entend euh, dans le public, euh, les, les, les agréments qui se font euh, par voie détournée. Il faut que ça passe par... Euh, plus, plutôt par un cadre institutionnel adéquat. Euh, autre chose, c'est que au niveau de, de, du développement, de, au niveau du développement de certaines applications, qu'on qu donne une priorité au secteur privé. Parce que c'est là où se retrouvent finalement les innovations, l'appropriation, euh, mais aussi le développement. Voilà comment euh, je pourrais répondre à la question, même si c'est un terme général. Il faut absolument qu'au niveau, euh, au niveau, au niveau euh, politique, au niveau des, des, des documents d'orientation générale, que le privé puisse être associé, mais aussi au niveau de la mise en œuvre de la politique, qu'il soit aussi euh, associé. Euh, et que euh, surtout les, les deux cadres légaux et, et, et institutionnels que cela puisse être fait avec la, la, la collaboration du privé pour que ce soit euh, de véritables cadres favorisants pour le développement de TIC. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister, and uh, uh, dear Jean-Jacques, in uh, one minute. Thank yes, you. Just uh, to shortly, yes, uh, Minister, uh, I want to, to just say that the okay, government should be encouraged to, uh, to collaborate with. Uh, private sector uh, in uh, the policies and strategies uh, frameworks but also uh, in the implementation uh, of those initiatives and that okay that we need some tools like uh, the, the set of laws on uh, electronic transactions uh, in which you can find this uh, problem of uh, authentication of signatures and so on and uh, uh, also what we call public key infrastructure which uh, can help also Uh, and uh, if there is a, a, a good uh, collaboration uh, among uh, those two stakeholders, uh, we think we need to build some, uh, some agencies uh, devoted to, 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 to facilitate the work and uh, to be allowed uh, in a delivering agreement and things like that to authorize uh, the, 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 the stakeholders and the newcomers in, in, in this society to operate uh, freely but uh, with uh, transparency and uh, in a good competition. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our session. We thank you very much. We thank our dear participants who are uh, our presenters. We have, um, we have Jean-Jacques uh, from ITU. We have uh, Catherine Gatao from the Ministry of Information, Communication Technology in Kenya. Uh, we are very thankful to uh, our, our gold sponsor, Elman Tigere, Chanakira, uh, Group uh, Executive Officer, 23rd Century Systems. Thank you so much for your presence. We thank you, uh, Paula Ingabire uh, from RIDB, who has given us a very passionate expose about um, 
uh, about the implementation strategies, the ICT implementation strategies in Rwanda. And last but not least, we need to thank uh, very profoundly uh, Clement Wajeneza, CEO um, Rwanda Online, and to thank all of you who have stayed put throughout the whole discussion. Uh, we, I think it was a very nice discussion, very engaging, uh, very committing. We've learned a lot uh, from different sectors and different areas of this industry. And I hope that this uh, uh, conference, this workshop, is going to bear the fruit that we all came here waiting for. Thank you very much.